it says C over N meters, assuming delta T is one second. Okay, now this is pretty straightforward because we know the energy density of volumes. We know that the energy density, the number of photons in this unit, in this volume of one meter by one meter by C over N meters is simply our defined energy density, rho of nu at some frequency nu, and we're assuming all these photons are at one particular frequency. And we know that they're essentially going to hit in a time of one second. And so we have rho over nu joules per cubic meter. And we multiply that by our volume in cubic meters, which is 1 times 1 times our length d, which is c over n. OK? And essentially, what we come up with is, if we look at these units, and let's go ahead and put the units on that, meters in one second, we come up with rho of nu times c over n gives us units of joules per second, or power. But since we've defined this to be a unit area, rho of nu, c over n, is equal to our intensity. And then we can convert this into whatever formula we'd like. For example, we also know intensity is 1 half square root of epsilon over mu, magnitude of the electric field squared. And so let's review this really quickly. Again, the general derivation was that we looked at how many photons there were in one volume that hit a unit area in one second. We know the power per unit area is given to be the intensity. And so our conversions between intensity at some given frequency nu um, is given by that equation right there. And the number of photons per unit volume is given by that equation right there. And again, uh, this is derived for you in a PDF file you can link on the reading assignment. So let's move on. Now that we have an idea of photons in a unit volume and atoms in a unit volume, let's take a look at the Einstein coefficients and what Einstein figured out here. Um, what we've got, of course, is lots of atoms. And in each atom, we have a picture that looks like this. Uh, most of the atoms are going to have an electron that can go be either an upper state or a lower state. And so every one of our atoms has something like this. And some of the atoms are going to be in the upper state and some are going to be in the lower state. And how the number in the upper state, let's call that state 2, and this is, of course, per cubic meter, and how the number in the lower state in 1 per cubic meter and so, of course, we're talking about all the atoms that are in a volume one meter on a side. And so our n is defined for the, all, the number of atoms in state two in this meter and the number of atoms that are in state one of that meter. Um, how that evolves in time. Now, we've seen, of course, and you've experienced in your life, if you have something where you excite the atoms, say a pulse of light or something like that, and raise a certain number into to the upper state, they're going to decay exponentially to the lower state. We can write a differential equation for that, assuming that what's happening is that our electron drops from the upper state back down to the lower state, and that energy goes into creating a photon. Let me go ahead and get rid of all of this stuff. We're going to need that later. And what happens when we do that is that we've gone and created light. And this light created this way through the process of spontaneous emission. Um, and that just means that the electrons are in the upper state and they drop back down randomly to the lower state. That's going to emit light in all directions. And this differential equation, the simplest of all possible differential equations to write, it simply says the rate of change of the atoms in the upper state decreases with time. That's what the negative sign here is for. Let me go ahead and get another color of ink decreases with time. It has some time constant, tau 2, and we know a rate is proportional to the time constant, so that decay tau 2 is defined there to be essentially the 1 over e point. And we can also write that as a rate constant. And the decrease, the rate, is also proportional to the number that are in state 2, because the rate's going to be faster if there are a lot in state 2, and slow if there aren't many in state 2. And we know that, of course, that's equal to 
the inverse of the change in state one because if it goes from state two, it has to end up in state one. Um, and that's another way to write it. This is essentially a very simple differential equation, um, very similar to a single bucket of water with a hole in it that's slowly leaking out in time. But now we're talking about the total number of electrons in an upper state or a lower state in some unit volume of space. Um, let's look at something else we're familiar with from our optics course, and that's the absorption of photons. Here what happens is we have an electron that's initially in the lower state. A photon comes in, gives its energy to the atom, the electron goes up into the upper state. Um, and so here's our, our, our block of material. Each of these atoms have a, a energy diagram that looks like this. And of the billions and trillions of atoms, struck by a large number of photons. Some are going to end up in the upper state and some aren't, and some of our photons are probably just going to pass through. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Here are photons coming in, some are absorbed, and fewer photons go out. Let's take a look at that again. Our photons come in, some are absorbed, and fewer photons go out. Pretty straightforward physical process. We can write a differential equation for that. Now the number of atoms that are in the upper state, N2, and remember N2 is the number per unit volume in the upper state, is increasing with time because we're taking our electrons and putting them up there. And we give it some rate constant we call B12. The 1, 2 means it goes, as the arrow shows here, from state 1 to state 2. It depends on how many atoms we have down in state 1, and it also depends on the energy density of the photons. Because if you have a large density of photons, or a large intensity, since these things are related to one another, the probability of moving an electron up is much higher. So everybody should be fairly comfortable with this, because you've all experienced absorption before. Again, let's go back real quickly. Some light comes in. Less light comes out. The lost energy is putting electrons into the upper state. Now, Einstein was a rather clever man, and he realized that this process could, in, in fact, happen in reverse, because things at the atomic level can reverse themselves in time. And he thought to himself, how am I going to describe the exact opposite of this process? And it's not spontaneous emission that we saw before. Because here the atom is affected by a photon, and he thought to himself, what happens if the photon comes along and hits an atom where the electron's already in the upper state? Can it cause that atom to release its photon down to the lower state? And in fact, that's what happens through the process of stimulated emission. Here we have a single photon going in. The electron is initially in the upper state when it's jiggled or jostled by this photon. It's like you're carrying a stack of plates and it's balanced up there and eventually you're going to drop it But when you're going to do it. But if somebody comes along and nudges you, it's going to have a high probability of causing whatever you're carrying to come crashing down. And that's what happens here. It causes the electron to go back down to the lower state. Well, certainly the photon that comes in isn't affected by this. And the photon that comes out is an extra photon. So let's take a look at this in our atom over here. Here we have a few photons coming in and more photons going out. And it turns out, if we look at this process again, that the photons coming out are in exactly the same direction and have exactly the same frequency of the photons that comes in because there is an interaction between the photon and the atom. And this is stimulated emission. And this one's harder to get your head around because there is no process in the real world that you have experience with that is similar to this. You cannot draw an analogy between stimulated emission and anything you've experienced. And that's why this is the hardest of these ideas to understand. But from a basic point of view, it really kind of makes sense. And we can, of course, write a differential equation for that. Here, the number of electrons in the upper state, in two per unit volume, is decreasing. So we get the negative sign. Uh, the rate constant is just B21, the 21, because it's going from state 2 down to state 1. Let's make that a 1. It depends on the number that are in the upper state, and it also depends how many photons are there. Because if there aren't any photons there coming in, this won't happen. 
If there are a lot of photons, the probability is higher. And of course, this is just the negative of how many are in state one because everything from state two needs to go down to state one. And these are the three simple differential equations that describe a laser. And we're gonna be working with these for the